love coach. Let's find out if you're ready for love. Here's your marvelous host, Nikki Lee. Hello, and welcome to Ready for Love Radio. This is your host and love coach, Nikki Lee. This week, I've got a surprise for you all. We are going to talk about religion and sex in a way that is probably going to surprise you all. And I'm going to get you mentally out of the box. And to help me do that, I've got Reverend Beverly Dale here this week. She is a published writer, a vocalist and performer, and in addition to being an ordained minister, her ministry has taken her from being a pastor in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ Parish in Illinois for six years to 21 years on the campus ministry at the University of Pennsylvania. She's now as the founder and chair of the Incarnation Institute for Sex and Faith. You heard me right, the Incarnation Institute for Sex and Faith. This is an educational nonprofit that teaches an inclusive, science friendly, and sex positive Christianity. Now, doesn't that sound like something I want to share with you all? Now, her ministry has a very specific and unique focus to help people of faith heal from the sexual wounding that occurs when they're taught to separate the spirit from the body and also to provide tools for those who are developing a Christian theology that affirms the body and pleasure as God-given. Now, see, that sounds like the kind of God that I believe in, one that created a body that's built for having pleasure and who doesn't mind that you enjoy it. I absolutely love that. So, Reverend Beverly, I am thrilled to have you with me today. (laughs) Well, I'm glad to be here and join you for this great conversation. You know, I, I looked at that, and I'm like, now, see, that, is the God I believe in. That's the one that I think is here and that created us and said that that doesn't say it's shameful to enjoy your body and it's shameful to have sex. And I say, that's the one I think that, that created us. So Uh this is cool. Uh I love this. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Well, I, I like to think that Jesus probably had a similar kind of God, um, in the, that, His model of how he lived his life was to go to feasts and banquets and tell stories about them. Um, His critics criticized him for being um, a party goer and and consorting with the wrong people and going to the wrong places. So it sounds to me like somebody who embraced life and embraced all of the sensuality of life. So, yeah, I think that's the kind of God that Jesus probably did have. Yep, I agree. So this is, I I think it's time for this. I think it's time for this. And this is so awesome, y'all. She has a new book out called Advancing Sexual Health for the Christian Client. And we are going to tell y'all all all kinds of cool things about this book. And y'all know how much of a priority it is to me to help people that are dealing with sexual guilt and shame. And I've, I've talked about that so many different times on here with so many different guests. And, I mean, my, my guilt and shame that I dealt with for so long came from, a big chunk of it came from the upbringing I had and was based in the religious upbringing I had. And I just, I am so excited about this book. <laughs> I really, really am. And from the first time Susan mentioned you to me, I was excited about having you on. So the first thing I want you to do, because I, I have had this question since I first heard about you, and I get to, I get to ask you now and get the answer. Okay. Let's start by, by helping the audience understand how you got started with being an ordained minister and working with being a sex educator. How does that happen? I know a lot of ministers, well, and I can't see any of them doing this. Oh, that's because they're not dealing with their own sexual wounds. Um, Ooh, I start okay. with uh, the, point, the point of start is, is sexual wounding. And uh, my, I was in a family that went to church every time the doors were open. We were very religious. We were very conservative, not fundamentalist as we have it now because this was of another era. But, of course, there was no talking about sexuality at all uh, right. in the pulpit or, or in the home, uh, except that um, we knew that uh, it was something bad. All right. And I already knew that it was something bad to be a girl. So there was gender wounding, which I put under sexual wounding as well. So that's 
so I got bad messages or or silence from my church about the body and sexuality and pleasure, but I got really bad news about being a girl. So um, enter into that picture of sexual ignorance, um, an older uncle who decided to get his sex education from my little prepubescent body. And uh, I was, I couldn't say no because he was a, a boy and older than me and I had been trained to be very obedient um, to the older people in my life, but certainly to a boy. And um, so that went on for a while. And, but, and I knew it was wrong. I also knew it felt kind of good, which was very confusing. And I also knew I could not tell my mother. So that secret then stayed um, throughout my life until I was, I don't know, maybe mid-20s, I finally told a husband, you know, my husband about it. But in the meantime, of course, um, that set me up to feel ashamed of my body because I knew that this was so horribly bad, this sexual secret was so bad that uh, I was sending out, I learned later, messages to the guys around me, stay away. So when someone did ask me out, I was so grateful. And then what happened next, of course, was violation of boundaries in a way um, that I didn't really give consent because I really didn't deal with anything below my neck in terms of sexual feelings. And so now, now we call that date rape. Um, and right. then that, that led eventually to a marriage where I was a teen bride uh, and pregnant. So there was just, that was more shame on top of it. So here I had um, a a daughter at the age of 18, and I was totally unprepared and totally cut off from my own sexuality. So over the years, um, fast forward to 30s, I began taking sexuality classes as I went back for my baccalaureate degree and realized that I, I was deeply, deeply traumatized um, from both of those situations, the abuse and then the, the unfortunate marriage that occurred as a result of day rape. Um, so in order for me to be healed, I had to deal with this stuff. And I couldn't go to my church because there was no good news there. So I went to therapy. And then I went to you know, sex education. I took every sexuality course that I could in an effort to bring about some kind of healing for myself. Then I had to go to the church and say, why didn't I hear some good news from you about being a female and about being a sexual woman? Um, And so went to seminary uh, when I was a little bit into my 30s and realized that I went to seminary because I felt called to the ministry when I was 11 years old. But, of course, I didn't have the right body part for that, so Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. So by the time I was 30, I had been in touch with the women's movement, and I realized that I was going to go to seminary because I was called to the ministry by God, and I didn't know if I was called to the ministry by the church. I didn't know if the church would recognize it. Well, being in seminary, I learned of all this wonderful feminist um, theology and liberation theology that helped me understand so much of the negativity about the body and women and pleasure is not coming from the gospel for sure, and not that much from the Bible. It's really coming from culture. And since I studied sociology, you know, I realized, oh, okay, so let's divide out culture from from, uh, faith, and let's go from there. And I realized I can stay inside the church, uh, and, and I have a passion about helping people who have that kind of a traumatic exposure to sexuality as I did, or perhaps not quite that bad, but still um, grew up with slut shaming or something's wrong with you because you are sexual or you're not interested in monogamy or whatever the issues are. There's a lot of, lot of shaming and uh, wounding that happens in the culture that Christianity gives legitimacy, legitimacy to. Um, yeah. So that's, in, that's a kind of in a nutshell. It comes out of my own sexual wounding. I, I had to, uh, I was seeking sexual healing, and I could find it when I finally tapped into biblical scholars and uh, people who have given this a lot of thought down through the ages, and I realized, oh, yes, there's always been a liberating message uh, within the Bible and within the, within the church. It's just, at this point, not the message that's getting play in media. Definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah. 
So that's my story. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. I, well, I'm glad I asked. <laughs> I, I like that. Well, I like to look at it. Let me uh, add one thing. Um, mm-hmm. I like to look at it as this is the road I have traveled. And as I turn around and look behind me at people who are coming along behind me in terms of age and development and experiences, I can say this path here will lead you to liberation and wholeness and healing. Um, and I know, and that's coming from my own uh, academic um, studies, but it's also coming out of my own personal story. And so I'm just saying, come this way if you want to find a Jesus who is a party goer and, and a God who is going to say, yes, get out there and have a great time with your body. That's why I made you. Um, so, I, so I think, you know, that's what, is my, my call now. Interesting. To the church. Yeah. That, well, and I think being a woman and doing all this makes it so much more powerful, too. Because, I mean, so many, I think so many women just feel they are just not empowered through religion. You know? Right. They just, they just don't. You know, even mm-hmm. even if they feel very strong in their their faith, they don't feel empowered within whatever religious organization they're with it, they're in. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I like mm-hmm. I like that very much. I'm very glad I asked that question. So, tell me, what is the purpose of the book, and who do you want to reach with it? Okay, the purpose of the book is to help <laughs> professionals who run into this kind of damage either in their parishioners or in their clients in the therapy office or even in the classrooms as they deal with, uh, with students in a sex education curriculum. So uh, the book is really for those professionals who oftentimes, well, usually, never have any preparation for the toxicity of Christianity when it comes to the body and women and pleasure. So, uh, so Rutledge's um, publishers are the ones who put it out, and they focus on professional books. And, and what I'm hoping to do is give some tools. My co-author and I, Rachel Teller, um, when we we weren't even thinking about writing a book at first, we were just doing a workshop for um, a national, well, actually international sexuality conference where professionals gathered, and we did a similar kind of a workshop that pre-book, and we discovered that we were actually triggering these sexuality professionals in the room, and that's when we realized, oh my goodness, these people do not know how to handle toxic Christianity, and so that's what was the impetus for us to put this together, and so we've got to give these people some tools and give them a way to deal with it, because anecdotally, we had heard that some of these cl- some of these professionals did not want to take Christian clients because they did not want to knock the props out from under them in terms of their religion. So the mm-hmm. secularly trained uh, academic uh, professional knew that the the reason you are having trouble physically in your relationship or emotionally with your sexual self esteem is because of specific religious beliefs. And so they didn't want to say, so stop believing, because people thought that was their faith. And so that was that's one of the first things we say in the book, is to say, wait a minute, there's a big difference between faith and between um, um, religious beliefs. And so that's, mm-hmm. that's a pretty important point that, that people who are not Christian, perhaps, or perhaps they uh, had just not really thought it through, um, they can, we do want professionals to support people's faith journey. It gives people hope and meaning and, and there's a sense of awe and mystery uh, about one's faith. You know, get, if, if that's really important to people, then we want to honor that and respect that. But in the therapeutic or the educational process, there has to be a way to slowly reveal that the source of these problems comes from specific religious beliefs. So that's, that's who we are, are focusing this on and what we're hoping to get out of it is to, to a better equip these professionals, whether they're clergy, pastoral, pastoral counselors, or therapists in a therapeutic setting. It's interesting, yeah. interesting that it was triggering the, the therapist. And that's, that's why, too, um, I noticed in one of the chapters where you're saying that it's so important when you're first making that connection with the client 
to to get a perspective and to understand, you know, their um, their faith and how important their faith is to them, but then also for the professional to have worked through their biases as far as Absolutely. religion and that sort of thing. And I can right. totally see how that would be important because if they haven't worked through their their perspective on religion and faith and that sort of thing, that's going to factor into, even though it shouldn't, that could very well work into and factor into how they work with their client. So Right. Yeah, right. And I'm, even I'm, even if someone is a total atheist, they don't give a, a, a hill of beans about uh, Christianity or any other religion, they can still have the experience of being triggered. They could still be traumatized because... Uh, this is in uh, the U.S. culture. It's deeply entrenched in yeah. our culture. And so that people who never go to church still try to abide or, or mouth that they abide by the, the sexual morality that's touted by the church, which is basically repressive yeah. on all ways. So, yeah, it's in the air that we breathe, unfortunately, over the United States. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. At least that's what they give lip service to. That may not be what they do in their private lives, but that's what they say. Right, well, yeah, that's true. I mean, statistics show it says very little difference between people who, uh, in sexual behavior, uh, between people who attend church all the time and people who don't. You know, the divorce rates are very similar. The sexuality issues, actually, the, the problems, sexual problems often are worse um, within those who are, are hope or clinging to Christianity. But, right. um, yeah. So I'm I'm curious from from your your perspective through your personal experience with people and through your research and work and all this, do you think there's an easy answer for why we get so much negativity from religion about sexuality? Yes, I do. Okay, I thought you might. (laughs) (laughs) So now you're going to get my opinion. Um. We, um, a hierarchical, patriarchal framework that is run by men for men, and that's elite men, not all men, of course, experience power like that, but the patriarchal framework, the construct in our heads needs to make sure that women's erotic power is repressed. So this is really about making sure that women do not understand there is a sex goddess in every one of us, that we can have multiple orgasms, we can outlast any man, now I'm being heterosexist in this, but that's my frame at this point, and we're pretty good at taking care of our children and our communities, and that's borne out by research as well, that when you go into villages where there's a lot of poverty if you if you funnel the money to the women the women will put the money back into the families and the and the children of the village whereas if it's going to the men it tends to get siphoned off into cigarettes and prostitutes is my understanding of that research so yes so i believe that centuries and centuries ago millennia ago women did run the world and we did it quite cooperatively and peacefully and there is research on that as well. But, but it, for whatever reason, the hordes from the north came in and did um, violently overtake those uh, peaceful uh, matrilineal tribes. And, and an, a framework was the emerge that was to keep women under control and to then view the entire world in, times of, in terms of hierarchy. So there's always got to be somebody on top and somebody's on bottom, which is part of the reason that the church has trouble, historically had trouble with gays because it, males, male homosexuality, because you, who's on top and who's on bottom in that? You know, you, you have to make sure that somebody is in the submissive role, and I, I'm talking about that in terms of the sex act, but I'm also talking about it in terms of um, who's, who's going to be able to have the most power. That's the way a patriarchal mindset works. And so the Christian church um, from about the fourth century on was the, their theology and all the dogma was being written by privileged, high-status European males 
who were deeply misogynistic and deeply sexually conflicted, and hence Christianity shortly after Jesus uh, left this earth, or within a few several generations, began to take on the form of that patriarchal domination paradigm. And and we can see right now in the world is where that domination paradigm leads us, is to near genocide of the entire planet. So um, empowering women to discard that shame of being a woman, all shame about uh, being a sexual woman or a sexual man has got to be um, discarded as, um, as, can I say crap? As pure crap. <laughs> jerking, jerking, um, as I want. <laughs> yeah, because, because it's going to save the planet, all right? It's going to save right. the planet. And so empowering women, empowering everybody to embrace the erotic center within us because that's what feeds and nourishes the spirit. Um, so all of this, uh, and we would not be spending the kind of money that we do now because we are sexually mm, vacant, you know, nothing happy is happening and there's not a lot of sexual happiness out there. So the institutions uh, count on the domination paradigm. I'm, I'm specifically using that instead of patriarchy because men think I'm against men if I use the word patriarchy, and I'm really not. I'm talking about a way of framing reality that that Jesus did, which was um, egalitarian, that we all are important, we all pay and um, have an important part, we're all diverse, and that's wondrous, and that's great, and we come up with better solutions to problems when we are in a diverse audience, for example. What's always so, amazed me when, when in any situation where men want to discourage their women, especially their wives, their partners, whatever, from exploring their sexuality is they're hurting themselves. I mean, yeah. right when you get right down to it, they're hurting themselves. You know, mm-hmm. it's like you would you would want your partner to explore their sexuality because that means you're going to enjoy your sex life more. Why do people not see this? But well, but they're trying they're, they're trying to hang on to the power that they're supposed to have. As men, you're given the message that you have the power and you have the power in your family. So it's power over. It's never power with, yeah. which Jesus modeled. You know? um, so it's power over. So if you have a woman who decides she wants to explore sexually and do different kinds of things in the bedroom or have different kinds of partners or whatever, then uh, an insecure man who has been told he has to have all the power because, and he should take it, is going to try very hard to make sure that that woman does not become sexually empowered to his detriment, to his detriment. You know I, can see how, I can see how wanting other partners could be, you know, threatening. I, I, I see how an insecure man could have an issue with that. But if she yeah. wants to experiment and do things with him, he's hurting himself if he says no. Right, but right. I don't know. Okay, now I, yeah. I noticed one of the, the comments was that the vision of the book is to move troubled Christian clients from sexual ignorance to sexual knowledge. And we all know that knowledge is power. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, so from a sense of scarcity of sexual pleasure and experiences to embrace ideas of abundance. I love that. And from the yeah. burden of guilt and sexual shame to experiences of sexual freedom and pleasure. Yes, that's right. where we want people to be. <laughs> so. Okay, yeah. So so the symptoms that we have, that we talk about in the book, the symptoms of our culture are a lot of guilt and shame. That's the first one. The second mm-hmm. one is sexual, sexual dysfunction and dissatisfaction. Right. And the third one is problematic sexual behaviors because you don't repress, repress, and repress and then expect it to go away. No, what happens is it pops up in ways that are abusive or you violate consent or, you know, that's where sexual assault comes in, that kind of a thing. So those are the three symptoms. And then the causes of those problems, we believe, are threefold. And one is ignorance. Just there's Mm -hmm. all kinds of sexual ignorance out there because, at least in this society, we do not, as a rule, teach comprehensive sex education. In fact, uh, there are eight states where abstinence is taught in which they are deliberately told uh, falsehoods. 
that is not supported by science. And that's the way Congress and this country wants it to be, evidently. So, but the more ignorance we have, the less satisfaction and the more problems there will be. So the second cause of the problem is that, well, so let me back up. So the church, when the church does not offer comprehensive sex education, or the church fights against parents uh, sending their kids to schools that do offer it, or they try to make sure that school boards do not offer comprehensive sex education, then the church is complicit in causing the problems of sexual dysfunction in our, in our culture. Okay. Totally agree. So, totally agree. So, yeah. And, and they do, and it's, it's just clear that the church doesn't want anybody talking about sex unless everybody's wearing wedding rings. And then right. suddenly it's supposed to be bliss, but okay, not, not for that. But the, the second piece is well, the church. You know, let, me, go ahead. let me say, too, one, one of my issues is there's, there's no segue between there. There's no bridge. You know, you go from you're not supposed to do anything to being happy and married, and how do you right. get from point A to point B? You, well, you don't have to with it. And there's a lot of couples who never make it, never True. make that jump because, um, you know, they're, they're, the wedding night is a disaster and the next right. year there may be three sexual encounters and all of them are painful and nobody's getting any happiness and then eventually there'll be a divorce or just an a acquiescence to a sexless marriage. So, and that's, I don't. I don't know that I have research on that, but there's certainly a lot of anecdotal research on that, and that's a lot of what the therapists are, are telling us happens out there. Well, like I said, so, the church is not giving any segue or any bridge between those those two positions for people. You know, there, there's nothing that's really helping you to get from single and do nothing to married and you're supposed to be happy. And, uh-huh. and you know, they, they build it up to this big, once you're married, you can have sex, but okay, what's that mean? <laughs> you know, right. nobody yeah. wants to talk to you about it. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, it would have to be straight sex, not gay sex. And no, it would no. have to be, for the most part, all these uh, procreative sex, meaning PIV, penis and vagina, no. uh, as opposed to variations on that theme. Um, oh, of course. So, Nothing yeah, else so, is acceptable. So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so you, that, you that brings up the, the second... <laughs> The, the second cause uh, of those problems is scarcity, that the church has a very deliberate strategy to teach that there's only so much sex that's allowed. And so you cannot have it outside of marriage. You cannot have it except in a heterosexual union. Um, you can't have it uh, too much or too often. Um, and there's just a lot of um, rules about pleasure and about you know, sexual, sexual access. So what happens is people end up getting married in order to have sex, which is not yes. a good basis for a relationship, given that after so many times of, um, with the same partner, things get dull, you know. So, okay, but you have no repertoire of how to do anything about that. So the whole scarcity piece is very problematic that the church um, has. And that, was, and that was deliberate. I mean, St. Augustine... Augustine was um, taught that. He said, you know, you, um, you can have sex. It's okay. It's not a terrible sin if you do it to make babies, but don't enjoy it too much. Now, right. this is somebody, you know, in the fourth century who was one of the key construction uh, workers of the whole Christian dogma. Um, St. Jerome was another one. You know, but, but they come out of a, a platonic worldview that the Greco-Roman world was about, so where they didn't value bodies, and they valued reason, intellect, you know, thinking, left brain thinking, more than passion in the body, certainly. So that was some framework that predated Christianity uh, by hundreds of years, and that's the, the work that, that was in the air when the, the church fathers did their work on their developing their theology. So between their sexual conflict themselves and their own misogyny, um, then they had all of this uh, sex negativity or body ne- ne- negativity that they just simply absorbed and put it into the Genesis story, for Pete's sake. You know, it has nothing to do with sex. Um, in the garden, but yet you'll hear people talking about, well, that's why they were kicked out because of sex, so because you know, and they were naked, and you know, making making it sexual. All of that right. comes from those church fathers 
who are just drenched in this body negativity. And then, of course, it gets passed on, and suddenly that's what Christianity is to be about, um, unfortunately. But, and then the third cause of these problems, is, besides ignorance and supporting ignorance and scarcity, is the suspicion of the body and the pleasure. That, and that, that's the platonic worldview. So you cannot trust the passions because they're going to lead you astray. Well, in the church, well, you cannot trust your, your passions because then you might become a hedonist. And then you'll just want to have sex with everybody um, without any controls. And, you know, then what would happen to the family and what would happen to X, Y, and Z, you know? So there's this real suspicion of pleasure that it will always give way to, um, to hedonism, which is, of course, not true. Uh, and so when I teach a sex-positive Christianity, I'm saying, no, we have to be responsible and be ethical in our sexual decision-making, but we also have to be, um, we can let go of the suspicion of pleasure. So that's kind of where I'm going with that. So that's the first part of the book where we talk about the causes and how it came about and then the symptoms. Um, and it really has nothing to do with Jesus. And it's real simple. So are you a Christian church that follows Jesus or not? Because if you are, then you need to let go of the St. Jerome stuff and the Ignatian stuff and the, um, oh, I didn't mean Ignatian. I meant Thomas Aquinas, um, some of those church fathers' teachings. You just got to let it go. And then we have pre preachers who still be preaching it, you know. Right. Everybody has to be straight, you know, that kind of thing. It's craziness. Speaking yeah. Of I notice in chapter two you talk about a suspicion about science and anti-intellectualism. I got it out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And it was interesting when you're talking about that. I, I had some aha moments about this discussion, also about me personally when I was growing up and some some things that were being said to me. Um. What? Um. What are some, because I, I was always discouraged from asking questions, and it's like, if there's anything you need to know, we'll tell you, and I'm like, I don't, I don't deal well with that. I have questions, and, and obviously I like to ask questions, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm going to uh -huh. and all this. Yeah. So how does, how does the suspicion about science work into this conversation? Um, well, in this country, the suspicion of science really began about in the 1920s. Uh, when archaeologists and anthropologists began finding evidence that the Bible was wrong. Um, and, and when they began doing a historical, critical, intellectual approach to the Bible, then, uh, then people were afraid, most men were afraid that here goes Christianity, it's all going to go down the toilet. So they didn't see that kind of research and that kind of pursuit of knowledge as being helpful to the faith they saw it instead as being something that's going to undermine the church. So fast forward now another um, 100 years, and we find, particularly in the U.S. now, much more of a uh, cultural anti-intellectualism, so that you will have uh, talking nasty things about road scholars who... Um, educated people who are sm too smart for their own britches, that kind of a thing. So uh, we have a, there's kind of a glorification of being non-educated. So that's in the culture. Um, so in the church, the form that it takes is um, if somebody says, if, if a man says, God called me to preach and you're my congregation, you will find people who will follow you then you can, you can have your church and you can be a, a pastor and you can teach whatever you want to, but it'll probably be a sex-negative message. As opposed to finding um, pastors who have been educated by people who honor the historical and critical method of approaching the Bible. And, and so we don't look at specific proof text verses to say, aha, you see, there it is. And now all straight, all gay people are going to go to hell. And there it is. We can't fantasize because of that one verse. That a literal understanding of the Bible is um, not grounded in the intellect. It's grounded in insecurity. That if if I find one mistake in the Bible, 
uh, or there's one error in the Bible, and of course there are many contradictions in Scripture and many errors in the Bible, but they prefer not to look at those. Um, but the, the thinking goes, if we find one, then you can't believe any of it. And so that in itself is a falsehood. So I say well, the work that I do is science-friendly. Science is a dialogue partner with me. And so if science tells me that there, there are brain differences in a gay person or a straight person, or if science is telling us there are brain differences in someone who is a trans person versus someone who is cisgender, uh, if science tells me those kinds of things, I'm going to listen to that, and then I'm going to go back to my Bible and read my Bible uh, with an open mind now that I know uh, science has informed me of, of things that are really important. So I will not be coming, I, when I come to scriptures that uh, have something to do with homosexuality, I'm going to keep in mind that, um, that God doesn't make mistakes, and that uh, science tells us there is a lot of sexual diversity across all species, uh, and so I'm going to, and and I will interpret then scriptures using a different criteria than memorizing Bible verses and spitting them out at certain times to win an argument. So uh, do not approach the Bible as inerrant. It is a word of God, but God is not uh, the Bible is not God. And right now we live at a time in which the Bible, specifically a sex-negative way of reading the Bible, is king. It is, it is God. And, and on my point is, no, it's not. God is spirit, mystery, um, love. And, and what is, when you spew out sex negativity and body negativity that's misogynistic and homophobic, there is no love in that. And it does not inspire us to uh, embrace our neighbor as Jesus taught us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So that kind of sex negativity needs to be critiqued with the Bible itself. Now, I don't know what you ask. I've just gone off on a tirade here. <laughs> I hope that's helpful. <laughs> well, I, think, I think one thing, too, is, is scriptures are often used individually and not used in the context. You know, why? Because... If, if I read something, I read the scriptures around it to get the context right. of how it was. Absolutely. I'm the prime. The prime one is women should be silent in church. That's in First Corinthians. But but the the verse preceding it, I believe, maybe it's after it, it says, "And husbands are to be submit to submit to the wife." But they don't ever quote that. Yeah, one. They, they never. Yeah, they they <laughs> they don't go back a little bit. Yeah. Right. So, right. Yeah. Well, and and you can you can have ten people read. Even even if they read like an entire chapter, you know, hmm. in, in the Bible, and and you're going to get ten different interpretations. You just are. Right. That's just what right. it is. Because you know? each one of us brings our own our well, own experiences to whatever, and we're all going to see it a little bit differently. That's just how it is going to be. Right. And so in our book, you're kind of moving me ahead to um, the way that one of the tools, the primary tools that we um, give these professionals is. Uh, to teach people to spiritually discern rather than mindlessly conform. So oh, people do, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> uh, so mindless say? conformity <laughs> is what religious and uh, the, the sex negative stuff is about. It's just conform. The preacher said this, the Pope said this, therefore you have to do this. Uh, and we're saying, wait a minute, there's a discernment process that's missing there. Uh, right. At no point, at no point did Jesus ever mindlessly conform. We've got in the model of Jesus somebody who challenged the religious rules of his day whenever it brought healing to people, whenever it in, impacted uh, relationships in a negative way. He was always there to break the rules on that. And so we have permission to break rules too if it's going to prevent healing or if it's going to fulfill a um, it, it prevents fulfilling a sexual need. You know, Jesus broke rules because his disciples were hungry. Well, can we break rules if the need is for touch or for sexuality? You know, that's that's why we we tell people then. All right, so there's there's a discernment framework. So all the Episcopalians in the world, um, all of the um, well, let's see, I'll stop, I'll stop with them. Or Lutherans also have three sources of authority. 
The Bible is the first one, of course. You go to your Bible, you see what the Bible says. But we're going to be for science friendly, so we're going to also listen to the researchers, the theological researchers who have done the work on the what do these words mean? What did they mean when they were written? What do they mean now? Um, and then we're going to, the second discernment, we're going to ask ourselves, oh, what does the church teach about this? Well, the church teaches all kinds of things about this. There's no singular Christianity, never was, never has been, <laughs> and not going to be in the future. So, um, for example, back in the Middle Ages, the church at that time had rituals for same-gendered people. And now they're saying that you're sexual perverts if you are attracted to the same gender. Well, wait a minute, the church has said different things here. Or we can look at other uh, churches on the block. You may have your church on one corner, but on the other uh, corner there is a Presbyterian church or a Lutheran church or the United Church of Christ, and those people do not condemn homosexuality. Or those people allow women in the pulpit. So, so you have the Bible in conversation with the tradition or the community. The third uh, source of authority is to use the intellect and ask yourself, well, what does science say? And what does my reasoning say? And all the theologians, even the sex phobic ones, were, uh, still were intellectuals. They, they did put their mind in gear and think about, well, who's going to benefit from this kind of a rule and who's going to be hurt by this kind of a rule? So that's the reasoning part. And then the United Methodist um, leader, um, John Wesley, uh, he's, he added a fourth discernment on this. And the fourth one was internal wisdom, your personal experience. What is God saying to you? We could say the Holy Spirit. So, because his heart was strangely warmed when he had kind of like a conversion experience. So we have the right then to say, let's take the homosexual um, example. All right, so you can pick out some verse. There are seven verses, seven passages in Scripture about homosexuality. You can choose the Leviticus. So it appears that they're an abomination. Okay, so let's put it in dialogue with the church and tradition. Well, the church has not always gone along with that. We can put it in conversation with the intellect and science and say, no, science is telling us there's very good reasons why people are different, attracted to different people. And then you can look to the inside of yourself and say, well, yeah, I, I always knew I was straight. And somebody else will say, well, I always knew I was gay from about the time I was four or five years old. So all of those pieces are in dialogue with one another and as you discern what direction we need to go. Um, so should I have sex outside of marriage or before marriage? Um, you would use the same idea. Well, what does the Bible say about non-marital sex? Well, not a lot. Um, certainly not negative. It's, you're not to have sex if, if the woman is connected to the matriarchal religions that were um, uh, having idols, all right? But you would you would just take it around all four, all four of those and and talk back and forth. Well, what is the inside of yourself? What does the relationship uh, look like and feel like? And are you ready? And how do you consider the consequences of your actions and so forth? Well, that's my personal reasoning. Um, you can we can look at reason and science and say that no, those people who wait to have sex after marriage um, versus those who don't, don't have any better relationships. Those marriages are not any happier if they explore sexually before. And then there are always churches, congregations, denominations who do not make a big fuss about sex outside of marriage. You know, what, what happens is it's not about body parts and which body part is going into which one with or without a legal piece of paper. Those churches will say, well, what's happening in the relationship? It's about relationship. So you could see the way one would frame the questions differently as we uh, come up with different kinds of um, answers to that. The best way, I'm not sure we talk about this much in the book, but the Apostle Paul was very clear in a very specific situation. The church in Corinth didn't know whether or not they should offer meat offered to idols. And his response, now that they were Christian, they were not bound by that. And his response was, one, you are free. 
You are free from all those religious rules you had. Freedom is first. Secondly, you cannot violate your conscience. So even though you know you're free under Jesus to do X, Y, and Z, if you still got some of that sexual guilt in your head or shame in your head, work that out first. Because you don't want to bring something uh, negative like that into the next step. But the third thing he said, and you cannot cause your uh, brother or neighbor to sin. So uh, you don't misuse your freedom. So if for me, um, going to a sex club, I can do that without um, having any kind of guilt on it. But, but if you want to drag your wife or your... <laughs> Your partner, uh, <laughs> and they and they're not wanting to go, you know, because they're feeling like this is wrong. Then you are violating the ethical principles that the Apostle Paul put out. So I think that's also a good way to get into sexual decision making. Perhaps your audience would be interested in that of thinking that through. You know, you're free. You're free from rules. Um, Martin Luther, the who went on to become the leader of the Reformation movement and the, ultimately the founding of the Lutheran Church said in a letter to his friend um, to go forth that we are to sin boldly. Sin boldly because we are already forgiven. We're already loved. Um, make the best decisions that you can. And that's what the Apostle Paul did, said. You know, okay, may, this is what I think God says about this but I'm not really sure well so you just move into your um, behaviors and your attitude saying I'm going to trust that God will love me even if this is a bad decision and I may wish I hadn't uh, done it you know just trust um, that God's love is sufficient for you and certainly God's forgiveness is there as well so I hmm. guess that's what, that's how you get to the abundant life Jesus promised in John 10 10 you know I come to give you life and all of its abundance and you cannot live abundance if you're busy trying to push down bad feelings or push down um, feelings that you have decided is bad or the church has decided bad, not that any feelings are bad. So I, I guess I'll, I'll – let me just stop there for now. Is that helpful? Is that helpful? I'm, I'm that, was, that was helpful. That was helpful. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Interesting. That that went round roundabout, but I, it was, that was interesting, though. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, what we were trying to do is have the professionals understand that Christians always do discernment, even those who say they don't. They just do what the preacher says or the Bible says. Because anytime you go to prayer, you are opening yourself. If you're doing prayer correctly, you open yourself to the leading of the Spirit. You open yourself to what is God going to teach me or tell me about this? Where is the nudge of God and the and whisper of God? That is being open. To, and you are discerning right. uh, when you ask God, should I do this or should I do that? Well, that's a discernment. And so, um, unfortunately, it's just people find um, comfort in thinking, I'm right. I know this is wrong. I know this is right. There's comfort in that, and, but it, that's on top of a great deal of insecurity that God really doesn't love us because we have these wonderful feelings that we're not supposed to have. The a professional, you don't you don't have to become a spiritual director. You don't have to know this stuff, but just know that that people do do this discernment. For example, just because um, okay, the Bible says X that homosexuality is wrong, but um, Uncle Ned, everybody knows, is gay, and he may or may not be out of the closet. And we love Uncle Ned, and so we're going to accept Uncle Ned. So what you've done there is you've taken the Bible and put it in dialogue with your own personal experience. And your own personal experience of Uncle Ned wins over any kind of biblical prohibition of sexuality. You see, so people do do that discernment, but, um, but, so they, but they don't recognize it. So we just want the professionals to understand that there is leeway. If what your religion is about is love, then let's not talk about your religious belief or your religious rule. Let's talk about what would a loving God want you to do or, or how would a loving God want you to be. Wouldn't a loving God who made you in, in God's own image want you to be sexually free, want you to be sexually uh, fulfilled? You know? Right. 
Okay. Well, my thing too is 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 if you are living your life only based on what your preacher tells you, one hundred percent. He says yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and that's that's how you're living your life, and you're not uh-huh. thinking for yourself in any way whatsoever. You basically are living your preacher's relationship with God. You're not having your own relationship with God, right? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. That's that's what it is. So so who is at the top of the, the heap on your faith? Is it the church? Is it the Bible? Or or do you have or instead of the top down kind of thing, do you have a God who's in this midst with us, within us? loving us and caring for us. You know, that's the kind of uh, supportive kind of God we want to have in our faith that's going to uh, give our life meaning and uh, and hope. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, you mentioned this thing called the myth of sexual purity. What's that? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, early, early 90s in this country... Um, there was a deliberate move on the part, started with the Southern Baptists, to create a purity culture, of the purity myth. It's, um, Naomi Wolf wrote the book, The Purity Myth. Um, and then ever since then, that, that has just built because it becomes a capitalistic thing. So now we can make money off of purity. So let's sell chastity rings and um, let's sell you know, little prom dresses for, for 13-year-olds to go to a prom with their daddy. Um, oh, okay. And then, okay. Uh, you know, true love waits kind of thing. Um, there's money on the, in that as well. So there's a lot of uh, push against kids to not have sex, not until there's that legal piece of paper. So first of all, my question is, who made the state in charge of your morality? Okay, but if you're waiting on that, well, okay, that's what it is. So, So purity culture is very, very damaging, particularly to women, um, because there's this, being our U.S. culture, there is a double standard. So men are told, boys are told you can't have sex, but of course, boys are touching themselves all the time when they go to the bathroom, so it's pretty easy for them to shift right into masturbation and right into sexual exploration. Uh, And so we allow that for the men, but for the girls, there's all this slut shaming that if a woman even begins to become sexually active and enjoys, God forbid she enjoys sex and not be married, then what we do is we slut shame and she becomes someone that no boy is supposed to ever want to marry. So they can have sex with her, they can't marry her. So there's just dangerous, yucky stuff for women out there in terms of the purity culture. Um, and there are several books being written about that. One is called Damaged Goods, and the other one was called um, Pure, um, Inside the Evangelical Movement That Shamed a Generation of Young Women and How I Broke Free. Um, there's another third book that just came out this year by um, Nadia Boltz Weber saying Shameless, a sexual reformation, and she thinks the church needs a sexual revelation. But, um, but particularly because there's been this concerted effort of people who are sexually, I'm going to say it, they're sexually wounded and they're sexually conflicted. And that's how you end up with men making inappropriate sexual advances, men harassing or uh, worse yet, even raping, because they are just sexually wounded and um, and in deep trouble. They haven't worked out their stuff. So that's all in the mix, uh, a mix of the purity movement that the church has been heavily involved in maintaining. Of course, it doesn't do any good. They, they get these kids to sign abstinence pledges, or they don't have sex any less often than uh, kids who do have sex more often, you know, younger. Um, so it's, it's a big enterprise and it's captured the culture and unfortunately in our society it's captured huge amount of federal funding dollars um, of people who are not, they're, not in, they're making these decisions and not being informed by sex educators or certainly not by the sex therapist who are seeing the damage caused by, to women particularly but to all of us, about the, what happens when the purity culture is all a child hears, um, and then when they get married at 25, they suddenly do not have bliss. They have only marital problems and sexual dysfunction, and they've 
never really come to grips with the glories of being a beautiful, wonderfully made um, human being who who is sexual. You know, so um, I, I'm just uh, floored by by the ways in which we have so mindlessly and un um, ignorantly, and we have ignorantly accepted the purity culture and. Uh, as being the way we should go, as if somehow that has something to do with God and something to do with Jesus, which, of course, it does not. No, it doesn't. But like I said, it's uh, th- this whole guilt and shame crap, and I like I said, I, I call it that frequently, among other things. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's um, definitely a priority for me to, to try to help people that are dealing with that or, like I said, mm-hmm. think that, that they don't deserve to... to get past all of that mess. Right. They really do. They that, really do. Yeah, yeah. Or oh, we have to if we're going to really liberate ourselves sexually and spiritually, actually. Um, yeah. But one of the things I'm really proud of is that in that book, we have I have written four Christian meditations on the goodness of the body, um, Christian meditations on pleasure, and then I've done a uh, hand massage for couples. So there are four of them. And uh, your listeners might be interested in knowing that we did put one of them on our website, the dataanddogma.com website. Um, awesome. And it's uh, a Christian meditation on pleasure. And what it is is that throughout the, the med- guided imagery, I'm asking people to appreciate and think about and experience, again, all of these sensual images. And then between the images, I'm quoting Christian theologians. Uh, one of my favorites is um, a guy named uh, James B. Nelson who said, if we do not know God in our bodies, we may not know God at all. Ooh, I like that. Um, isn't that lovely? What, um, if you want to give me the link to that, I'll uh, add it to the show page where I'm going to put the okay. uh, replay for today's show so people sure, can easily well, do that. Mm-hmm. Okay, awesome. sounds good. Awesome. Well, I'm going to have a replay of the show. I've got the link to your website. Uh, actually, I'll have all your, your links to your website on the page. And then the link to what she just mentioned, so you can get that easily. Okay. And that's going to be at www.readyforloveradio.com slash Christian Client. So I'll have everything right there so you can easily get it, along with more information about Reverend Dale. So thank you a whole lot for being with me today and sharing the information. I, like I said, I've been very curious to get more information since I first heard about you. <laughs> so. Okay, well, thank you for letting me go on and on. I love to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, I've got one. I would. Folks might be interested in knowing that I also have a YouTube series called Sex is Good. That's free. We're working on a study guide right now. There are eight of those. Uh, they can find that on my channel, Rev Beverly Dale. And then I have a webinar series that's four parts, and uh, we are selling that on our website as well. If people really want to get into this uh, as, a, as a good study, um, it's a really a good curriculum. It's about seven hours all total. Um, that's awesome. very inexpensively priced. So. Awesome. She's got all kinds of interesting things on her website. She definitely, she definitely should take a look around. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll, we'll have links for all that. And like I said, just, just take a look at her website and just, just kind of Browse. <laughs> uh huh. There you go. Definitely. Definitely. So next time you you got something you like to talk about, just let me know. And we'll do it again. Okay. Sounds good. All right, and listeners, I will see you next time on Ready for Love Radio.